Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside you find a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, in this breed of dog that can bend its nose all the way back so it can touch its spine. At the corner table, by the fire, are three people. One of them is explaining all the different things that this wonderful dog can do. And that is me, uh, your co-host, Matthew Melema. And welcome to Believe to See. We are a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Here over at Believe to See, we explore how art and faith interact with storytelling and connects our stories to the great story. Uh, to find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And here, I will tell you, these past few weeks over at the Anselm Society, we have been talking a lot about story, we've been talking a lot about time, we've been talking a lot about how they all interact in the medium of paint and portraiture. What? And I've been talking a lot about dogs that can bend their snout back and touch their spine. But uh, we'll get to that in a bit. First, uh, let's bring in our co-host, Christina Brown. How are you? I'm great today. Thank you. Good. Well, I, I had a feeling you would be doing great, and I will tell you why. Oh. Uh, so when we were doing the, you know, the scheduling for the podcast, we have the guests. We want to get a co-host on. So I had seen if you could be the co-host, Christina, but then I found out you had like this other thing you had planned for this evening. So it's like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> don't want to overburden her schedule. So I asked Mandy... When I told you about Christina, I could tell through your text. Oh, I bet. Through the text, like, oh, I think she's actually really disappointed. I'm sad. So I called you and found out, no, 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 you'll make your scheduling thing work. You want to be on this show. I do. Nicole's too cool. I do. <laughs> and speaking of which, our guest here, Nicole Beck Conklin, welcome to the pub table. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So, uh, listeners, you probably know this by now. If not, it means you're brand new to the podcast, which, welcome. Uh, but we have our big Imagination Redeemed conference coming. It is, what, just about a month away now, right, Christina? Yeah. Okay, so we're recording this in late August. I'll probably post sometime in September. Late September, early October, Imagination Redeemed conference. Do we still have tickets available? We do. Okay, so we will probably have like a few tickets available when this posts. So buy your tickets immediately. It's at Glen Erie Castle here in the Springs. We have a castle, because back in the 1800s, we had a crazy rich guy who built one. And it's great. Uh, it's where we had it last year, loved it. And our featured artist this year is Nicole Beck Conklin. So we're gonna talk about your painting, a lot wow. about your painting. But first, I wanna talk a little bit more about your dog. Because we realized she's the star of the show. For we sure. realized as as uh, you were coming in to, to start recording, me and you share a passion for weird dog breeds. So, what kind of dog do you have? So we have a Tamascan, which she's she's basically when people ask, we say she's a husky from Finland, sort of the quick. 10 second answer, um, but yeah, so it's a bit of a newer breed from Finland, and we got her up in Seattle just about five years ago. She. Looks like a wolf, but other than that, is just all dog. Just the biggest, soft, sweetheart. So Aww. they are very cool because if you ever have like a, like a play or a movie, <laughs> or if you're the North Carolina State Wolf Pack football team, <laughs> and you want to have a wolf, but you don't want it to, you don't want the wolf to eat people. You get this dog. It's a great choice. <laughs> it's great, and I was telling you my my dog that I do not have yet. <laughs> Christine, if you can help me convince Danielle. It's called, I might be on her side. I'll, I'll think about it. It's called the, I'll make my pitch. Okay. It's okay. the Lundahund, which is Norwegian for puffin dog. Oh, that's kind of so cool. So they were bred to climb the fjords and capture oh. puffins in their nest. That is kind of cool, actually. So yeah. they have flaps in their, they look like little huskies. So they're like the size of Jack oh. Russell Terrier, but they look like a husky. They have special flaps in their ears. I'm Listeners, it's probably good that you can't see the hand gestures I'm doing. <laughs> So they can fold their ear flaps down so water can't drip in. They have an extra dew cloth for extra grip. And they're so flexible, they can move, they can bend their neck, I mean their nose, all the way back so it can touch their spine. They're a miracle Weird. of nature. Do puffins damage the fjords or something? What's the purpose of hunting the puffins? Well, I think back in the day, you know, if you were like a Norwegian like fisherman or, you know, you, you can't do Viking raids anymore. <laughs> so you need to supplement your income other ways. So sure. they capture the puffins for... Meat? I don't know, meat, feathers, I, I don't know, <laughs> something right. like that. Probably their blubber. 
Mm? The puppet plumber. <laughs> the puppet plumber. Mm, They're oil lamps. Yeah. These are all possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can't whale anymore. Puffins it is. <laughs> but the, you can learn more about this on my other podcast I'm going to be starting. <laughs> Obscure dog breeds today. Um, but, so Nicole, <laughs> the other reason we want you on the podcast is to talk about your painting. Because, like I said, you're going to be the featured painter for the conference. And, and for, those, uh, for, for those listeners who haven't been to the conference before, each year we have, you know, pretty elaborate art gallery. Uh, Christina, t- tell us about that, because you're more involved in the art gallery in the conference organization side. So what are we doing for the gallery here? I'm actually not as involved. Um, I know a lot of the artists, but uh, one of the art skilled member artists is the one organizing it, Krista Isler. So she would be the one to talk to, not I. Well, fine. Sorry. I'll tell the listeners what I know then. And that is, we had, like last year, we had a really great collection of uh, different artists all on you know, the same theme. And this year's theme is time and our role as human beings living in time on in dealing with time, eternity, and my words are getting all mixed up. It's a tough one. It is a tough, it is a tough one. one. <laughs> so... So Nicole, living in time with an eye to eternity. That's so, there we that's go. It. There I you should go. Have, I should have had it written down in no, front of me. No, that's that's cool. Okay. That's it's a tough one. So let's start with you, Nicole, as as a painter. So we're gonna get to your painting and like how they touch on time and eternity here before long. But let's talk about you as a painter. So how did you get your start painting? What was like your first spark of inspiration getting going on that? Yeah, so I've always been creative as a child. I My parents were super supportive and having me in art classes and pottery classes growing up and letting me use all the computer paper to do my sketches, which was a great sacrifice, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and then it wasn't until, so I, I just sort of was, you know, fairly casual, but something I enjoyed. Um, and then when I went to Mississippi State University, um, I got a microbiology degree, but I got an art minor with something that I wanted to work on. So... One of my first classes that I did there, you know, I did a couple drawing classes and then um, I was looking at the catalog one semester and there was an opening for a watercolor class, which generally was just for art majors. They didn't have a lot of spots, so it was pretty hard to get in and sort of slipped in right at the last minute (laughs) under the bar into this watercolor class. And the professor of that class, um, who is probably in all of my studies, the best teacher I've ever had. He sort of adopted me as the like non-art major (laughs) project. So he was able to get me into other classes and oil painting classes. And then I ended up doing a like thesis semester at the end with him with just portraiture, which is what I wanted to do. Um, So then, you know, after I graduated, I ended up going right to nursing school after that and definitely went through a little bit of like a dry spell, I guess, as far as painting with just the amount of school. I do hear nursing nursing. school is pretty... uh, It was pretty... It'll it'll suck the life out of anybody. (laughs) So, um, and then really didn't paint much for quite a while. And then um, 20... trying to think the year through here. I moved to Colorado in 2015 and contacted a couple galleries around town. And one of them agreed to let me have a show with like basically one painting being like this but more like somehow they um, decided it was worth a shot. So I, I had the opportunity to do a couple art shows here in town. Um, and then, yeah, 2020, I started a um, graduate studies program at Regent College up in Vancouver in um, Christianity and the Arts concentration. Oh, and neat. so, yeah, that's sort of another thing I'm working on right now. Pretty slow, I'm about halfway through. Um, and yeah. Here I am. All right. So let's let's talk about this first part of part of your journey. Thing. So the thing that stuck out to me was hey, you said you already had an interest in portraiture at that like early stage in your college learn, learning the craft. What, what was it about portraiture that really stuck out to you? And when did that start? Was that like when you were a young girl or was that kind of like in college? You're kind of like. So I think initially I did have when I think back, I had a little bit of interest in portraiture in high school because I remember I was homeschooled so my mom was able to like you know make a art credit class for me like homeschoolers do and I I remember doing a lot of portraiture I I did like a sort of an online class on it so I started doing a little more there Um, and then definitely a lot more in college later Um, 
But I think it's always been something that I've been drawn to, um, whether it's for a lot of reasons, I think. Like, there's sort of the formal reasons. Like, I think the, the complexity has always been really interesting to me, mm. and the focus on, like, light and contrast and form and how, just how exact it has to be. You know, mm. like, certain things like landscapes or even like, for example, even like the hair on a portrait, you can sort of like let it do its thing, but you people know if the face isn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we just have such an innate sense of where things are supposed the, to be. The uncanny right. valley, right? Yes, ex exactly. They can get weird really fast. Oh, so, and so, symmetry, sorry, really, symmetry no, is yeah, so hard to capture. Yeah. So like I, it's just yeah. so. Yeah. I, I was talking to my dad about the uncanny valley concept <laughs> in, in the uh, context of why like the Polar Express and those Robert Zemeckis movies are so creepy uh -huh. because human beings. Can I just pause uh, vernacular? The, the what concept? The, the uncanny valley. <laughs> yes, okay. I'll explain it. Yeah. Okay, you're going to explain it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So my understanding, and you are the portrait artist, so you'll probably be able to do this much better than me. But my understanding is human beings, pretty much all of us, without realizing it, we're all awesome at knowing what a human face should look like in pretty much any situation. Like, mm -hmm. like in our situation, like I, I can see you all, like the lamp light is hitting your face in a certain way. When you smile, like your skin creases in a certain way, the pores move when you move, like all these microscopic things. We all know it without realizing it. So when something gets really close, but something's just a little off, like the Polar Express, it looks really realistic, but something is off. We can't quite put our finger on mm -hmm. it, and it drives us all nuts. Or like the new Cats movie. Yes. Similar thing. Yes. Mm. Where it was like humanoid is very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so like if something's a cartoon, we're like, okay, that's cartoon, whatever. But something's really close to real life, but not quite there, that's sure. just creepy. Sure. Yeah, not good. Okay. So And it was interesting what you said when you mentioned symmetry, because like... Yes, symmetry, but at the same time, no one is symmetric. So right. when you're painting, how do you paint an unsymmetric face in a way that looks like you did it on purpose? Mm -hmm. Because no one is really symmetrical. It's it's very fun. And now I have a practical question. Yeah. As far as portraiture, does that does that like encompass all of drawing human forms, or is portraiture specifically a person captured on canvas? Portraiture, I think, generally mostly refers just to face but a lot of times figure is worked into that as well a lot of people will do figure and there is a face but well, I guess portraiture was... tends to be more formally like a tends to be like head and shoulders is like the classical like right. head and shoulders right i guess i'm sorry i didn't explain that while i was thinking like does a portrait have to be of basically someone who exists right a a rendition of somebody or can it sort of be you know a, Botticelli's Venus or something, you know, like, yeah. did he do a Venus? I don't know. I think so. Is that the one I was thinking? Uh -huh. It was the birth yeah. of Venus, right? The birth of Venus. Yeah, thank oh, okay. you. Yeah. There we go. I was there like, we... oh, I've probably got that artist there wrong. There we go. That my, good but job. No. <laughs> so is that, is, that, is that also considered portraiture if it's just a, an imagined figure? Like if you were to do like a portrait of Venus, would that be considered yeah, portraiture? I might have someone comment on the podcast that this is totally wrong, but I feel like why not? I mean, I don't feel like why, I don't feel like a person necessarily has to exist or not. Like I think okay, okay. a lot of it is sort of intent and focus. What's the, the spirit of the painting? What are you trying mm -hmm. to, is it about a person and an identity? I think. Okay. Sure. I was just thinking that way because like, you yeah. know, symmetry, like we can imagine a god or a goddess having like absolute yeah. perfect symmetry, uh -huh. right? So I was thinking about that when you said, yeah, the, the human form is not perfectly symmetric. So you have to find the symmetry, but also find where it's not quite symmetrical. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and along those lines, that, that got me thinking, Christina, because for it seems like through most of human history, portraiture would serve two purposes. One, you know, the artistic, you want it to look beautiful, you want it to be technically good. But the second is you want to know what people look like <laughs> and you want to preserve that yeah. so you can, you know, keep a family portion then like 50 years from now. That's what I looked like when I was young before my horse injury or something. We're like, <laughs> so like, that's what your grandpa looked like or something like that. And that was the only way to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now we all have cameras so we can mm -hmm. do that. So that part, the necessity isn't there. Mm -hmm. So how has that changed like the way that artists like yourself approach the, the craft of portraiture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's less, and again, you can find examples of artists doing everything. So there are people who, who literally paint a portrait like a photograph, like mm -hmm. very photorealistic. Mm -hmm. And that's not not valid, right? Like there's a reason for doing that. That's not necessarily the direction I take. But I think because we have access to photography and these different tools, 
more portraiture these days, I think, is meant to show something that isn't there visually, to give you mm. the feeling or, yeah. um, I think it was, so I'm going to mention this guy a million times probably, so, <laughs> um, which again, my instructor in Mississippi State, he was the one who introduced us to this. To, I'll just, I'm just going to start from the beginning and tell you about my first oil painting class because it'll set the stage Very for nice. this Ooh, man. We, we, we <laughs> love narratives and stories oh, on this great. podcast. This is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, oil painting one, all these, you know, sophomores walk into this class full of excitement and <laughs> wonder and they just know they're going to be painting these like, you know, gorgeous portraits and all this stuff by the end of the class. So. We get the supply list from Brent Funderburk, which is, he's an amazing watercolorist. I'd recommend looking him up. Um, so we get the supply list and we have, you know, some oil paints. We have one medium, which he says, like, try not to use it. And we're like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just in case you need it, but you shouldn't basically like that kind of thing. And no brushes, just a palette knife. Oh. Specifically this one brand, which is hilarious to me because he gets so much flack, but he's like, the Bob Ross brand palette knife is the way to go. Like it's the best <laughs> yeah. one. It has the right spring and the right size. So just a palette knife. So we get in this class full of anticipation and all of our big dreams. And he says, no, like you will not use brushes. You will use this palette knife all semester and you will earn your brushes. If you can't paint with this palette knife, <laughs> you, have no, awesome. you have no purpose. Like you have no need for these brushes. You're just gonna like mess around, right? <laughs> Oh, wow. And so, you know, and then on top of it, we're like, okay, fine. Like, well, you know, there's something here. And then he's like, and for like the first month, we're painting monochromatic toilet paper rolls. Still life of a toilet paper roll. <laughs> what? Lit there. You know, the, the dream is crushed before your eyes, you know? <laughs> and, so, and so. It's like, I was going to paint the birth of Venus. Yeah, What's going on? exactly. Like, this is not, I can't hang that in my room. <laughs> I can't give that to my mom for Christmas. Unless it was 2020 in the Oh, you know. Know. <laughs> so I still have my toilet paper roll and it's, <laughs> it's immediately become like way more important in, in my yes. life and I'm like displaying it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you know, later on, you know, as we're painting, he would walk around the room reading from this book called The Art Spirit by Robert Henry, who is who I'm going to talk about <laughs> all day. Um, so he was a painter and um, did a lot of portraits, a little bit of other stuff, um, but again, very loose. Um, so with the palette knife method, it definitely like helped teach us a lot of the themes of what we were doing. And one of the things, so now we finally made it back to portraiture. <laughs> when he was talking about the face, um, like what one thing he said was that the face is not intrinsically beautiful, just like a landscape isn't necessarily, it's in the transitions, it's in like, a fleeting glance like you see something and then it's gone you know it might be like the light changing in the Grand Canyon it's perfect and then it's gone and so painting is a way to capture these glimpses I like to think of it as like glimpses of eternity or glimpses of truth in there and, and we see it for a second um, so as an artist trying to identify those things the the spirit of the person a specific emotion or sort of essence of, of who they are mm -hmm. in a second. And so um, he talks a lot in this book, If especially if you're a painter, I would love this book. It's definitely a lot more of like painting focused, um, but he talks a lot about like painting from life, which I haven't done much of, and how you can't let the model distract you from your original intent. Like you had, you had an idea, you had an emotion, you had a gesture. Mm -hmm. And if you're not careful, the model in front of you, who's the same person will distract you from that. Cause they're ever changing. Like right. no one's going to sit there for six hours with the same, like exactly the same, the same thoughts, yeah. you know, cause even yeah. the model sitting there is just, you know, they're just passing the time they're thinking, and maybe they have a look and you're like, right? that's the one. <laughs> So you have to be they able to that, remember. That frown, Dang it, I forgot to fix my Exactly, you can't exactly. Have the dawning, dawning yeah. realization expression <laughs> right. for the whole day. You can't. Yeah. So <laughs> you have to have, as a painter, you have to remember and you have to not be distracted. Yeah, I wondered about that a lot because obviously we were talking about, you know, back when we had no cameras, right? With yeah. cameras, you can kind of, and, and there is like portraiture and cameras, like in, in Photoshop or photo work too, but you didn't get that like once upon a time you had to keep that that snapshot as it were in your memory as yeah. an artist so a painter or a you know a sketcher and I just think that's so cool that, that that's something that that we still do in portraiture and that's still important to you in particular yeah so I liked what you're saying about trying to like capture this like slice like this one this one fleeting glimpse mm -hmm. about how it, it almost seemed 
what you're saying. Correct me if I'm, I'm misunderstanding this, but yeah, it's not the face itself. Like the face just in a vacuum, there's really nothing. It's, it's the face doing something. It's making an expression, doing a transition. It almost seems like there's a narrative aspect to that. Mm -hmm. it, would you say that part of being a portrait artist is trying to infuse like a narrative or a story into this one image? Yes and no. Um, I feel like it can go both ways. So on one hand, I think every portrait or every painting, but specifically portraiture, like there's a story you're trying to tell. So maybe you're trying to convey, like if we're thinking of like a, you know, a singer sergeant portrait or something, you can tell what he's trying to convey, whether it's like the delicacy of this woman and her, or her innocence or this man's like stoicness or whatever it is, he's got a sort of that narrative of some story he's trying to tell. He's not just like, you know, taking, you know, like if it was photography, he's not taking school photos of everybody. You know, like we're not just trying to be like, okay, okay, okay. Like you're trying to tell a story, um, even if it's just a story as simple as what it feels like to exist. Or, you know, we've all, you know, known someone or we've seen that look on somebody or we felt that emotion. And so it's a little bit less like concrete than certain painting for sure that has a very strong narrative. So on one hand, I would say yes, but on the other <laughs> hand, <laughs> I would say not necessarily in the way that people think, especially I think within the church, we can have this idea that like all art needs to have a point or tell this specific message or like what's the specific truth you're trying to convey, mm -hmm. which obviously there is truth behind all beauty, but I think also there's something to be said for just painting what you like and not overthinking it. I think sometimes we can get bogged down with like, oh, my art's terrible because what's the point? Like, why does the world need this? But I mean, if we think about like our kids, you know, you can like, if you have a son, he could be drawing dinosaurs for a year and you would never tell him like, but what's the point? <laughs> you know, he's just, he's drawing what he loves. And I'm I speaking think, to a dinosaur enthusiast yeah, over no. here. <laughs> there's a lot of dinosaur yeah. art that my kids have done that I can show you. Right. And so there's, much. There's the value of, of drawing what you love and the fact that you can draw a thousand dinosaurs and, and you want to draw a thousand and one dinosaurs. I think portraiture can be like that. There's something intrinsically just, I love it. Mm -hmm. And that can be enough to do. Do you see like when you when you look at people just you know walking down the street since you capture so many people's faces and stuff do you feel like you you have a better I don't know I shouldn't say better but you have a feel for like noticing that one thing in someone's expression as you see them or that moment like do you just kind of like catch those as you interact with people yeah know? I don't know about more because it's my only experience that I know but but yeah I love I love people watching I yeah. love sitting in coffee shops and watching people or sketching people or, um, you know. Wait, do you sketch I'm not people that, that creepy person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple times. It's not, not a regular practice for sure. But um, yeah, yeah, I love, I love faces. And yeah, yeah. Um, just tr tr like the way that you can discern what's going on in the world and in people's lives through their faces and mm -hmm. um, I feel like I've always been a pretty intuitive person. I don't know which came first, if like painting made me more intuitive about people or it was the other way around. Okay, that's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Kathy Cook, she she's a, a psychologist. She, she talks a lot about like, you know, the eight great smarts, like people who are smart, you know, body oh, yes, smart, music right. smart. And I feel like I've always been very people smart. And so I wonder yeah. if there's definitely an interest there. Um, to why, why portraits yeah. have always drawn me a little bit. Yeah, and related to that, it's just the, I almost think it goes back to the Uncanny Valley talk, right? Like, all of us are so good at looking at faces, right? There's the, the technical stuff, like, again, like, is the skin stretching like it should? Is the light bouncing off like it should? Then there's the, the emotional aspect, too, because all of us, you know, some are better at it than others, read faces all the time. You know, the, a person's expression is one of the most important uh, modes of, in, of input that all of us just get being humans out in a society with other people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I recently heard a psychologist, psychologist, sorry, not interrupting, yeah. but say that I think, <laughs> sorry, not interrupting, but actually interrupting. <laughs> just interrupting real quick. I'm going to change that. Though, real quick, real quick. Point, not to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but they said, um, 
Uh, the psychologist said that that body body um, language, mm-hmm. like you were saying, is probably like eighty percent of how we like communicate with each other. Yeah. And nobody realizes that, yeah. but it is like that. Actually, is the studies they've done as the composition like percentage is the eighty percent body language. So yeah, it's it's huge. And this is a, a tiny tangent, but I think interesting. So I'm also a NICU nurse. Um, is like my job, I guess, Nikki, one of my cool. jobs. Yeah. So baby nurse, baby ICU. And um, we've just had some interesting things come out um, during the pandemic where we're having to wear masks and how that's affecting mm. child mm. development, even just from yeah. like a, a, a very brand new baby, how it may be affecting how they're learning to eat, like with the bottle, mm-hmm. not being able to see faces. And yeah. so even from that age, we're so face centric, like they know that's where to look. Mm-hmm. They'll track you. Um, so there's something in us that's drawn to faces, um, even if you know it's someone who doesn't think like, oh well, I'm not, a, I, don't, I don't like portraiture, but you like faces. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah, yeah, everyone you, does. You, you do. You're, you're does. a face expert, yeah. whether you realize it or yeah, not. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry, I continue with what you were saying. Thank you, Christina. You're <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the, this process thing. So I am so fascinated that you go start oil painting 101. Don't use a brush. Yeah. How was that in just like forming you as an artist? Was it helpful? What, what, what did it do? Very helpful. And and if if you see my art that's in the conference this year, you can definitely see the influence because I think I grew I grew to love that. And I never, um, up until very recently, I didn't move away from that. So mm. right now I have some current work. I'm like learning to use a brush. And whether I choose to stick with it or not, I just feel like it's a skill I want to try and see if I can integrate it. Um, but yeah, so we, the, the whole idea behind it is that with a painting, the, if you don't start well, you can't finish well. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of times the temptation is to go, you know, dive into the details. Maybe you start with just, you know, you just want to dive into the eyelashes, right? Mm -hmm. Right from the start. (laughs) But if you don't start well, you, you can't finish well. And so, um, Robert Henry in this book, and then my teacher as well have, these ideas that like getting the big basic shapes correct is how you have to start every painting, whether it's with a palette knife or not. So, you know, if you divide the painting up into, you know, seven or eight blocks, so like the light side of the face, the dark side of the face, the hair, the background, the shirt, you should be able to paint all of those as a block color in the right tone and color. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you the sense of the painting. And then after that, it's just detail. Um, so basically he was, by taking away our brushes, he was forcing us to think in big shapes and to look at our palette and think, what color do I mix that I can cover this whole section in that's correct, basically. I love that. You know, the top of the toilet paper roll, the front <laughs> of the toilet paper roll. The um, shadows. Yeah. <laughs> And then by the end, so we actually did get a little, we did do some small portraits at the end of that class with a palette knife. And then I just was so interested by that, that when I did my um, like thesis with him my senior year, that's what I did was palette knife portraits. And two of which, those original, two of that original group are in the conference. Um, and then I have a newer one as well. And so, yeah, it's just, it's a totally different process as far as, um, My friend Liz was talking about it, about how, you know, rather than this like detailed sort of slow, like blending and shading, it's more of like sitting and thinking and planning Mm, for longer and then action. It's, Mm. you can't be inhibited with the knife. You have to just do it confidently and you have to go for it. That which, terrified me. Did that yeah, terrify yeah. you, Christina? <laughs> it is half terrifying. I can't imagine ever being yeah. able to do that. <laughs> like, there's this point where you're almost done, and then like the highlight on the eye, and you've just got to go. Yeah, for that it. would terrify me. That yes. would be. And yeah. so, like, and that's just something that's been so fun for me. So recently, just a couple weeks ago, I was down in Santa Fe, and there's a gallery down there I love called Evoke, and they had an artist there named Lynn Bojess, who does big palette knife. I think he actually uses like masonry tools. They're, they're so big, oh, um, landscapes. But I was telling my husband, like we're looking at these paintings and I was like, you don't understand. Like when you stand far away, it looks like a landscape and then you get up close and it's just all these shapes. And I was like, look at this part, like this white that's over this green where the green's coming through, he had to do that in one swipe. Like there's no second tries oh with gosh. this stuff. And that's <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> like 
I'm, I'm the sort of person in, uh, when I write, I hate doing first drafts yeah. of words that are written on a computer and I can delete all of them with yeah. no consequence. And that terrifies yep. me. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I love it though. There's something <laughs> exhilarating about it. Um, and then you but know, what happens if you put all those hours into it and then, dang, it's gone? Like it's well, done. like you sneeze at the last second. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, maybe you can work it in. You know, sometimes <laughs> the other thing because it's looser, some you can get away with a little bit mm. for sure. As as a great painter, Bob Ross said, "There are no mistakes, are no only mistakes. happy accidents." There you go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You just got it. You hope it's in the hair or something. <laughs> Where, where no one cares, eyelash. not the eyelash or the, yeah, so, and you just gotta, you know, at the end of the painting day, you just have to make sure, like, is this all good? Because once it dries, it's so textured that mm. you, it's really hard to correct after the fact if, like, the tone is off. So you have to figure out, like, am I scraping this off and trying tomorrow, mm. or am I good with this, mm -hmm. where it is? Because um, you end up with, like, thick, thicker paint on the canvas, so. Yeah. How fun. many how many practices or, or fails do you feel like you have to have it with like different portraits before you feel like you have one you love? Um, it really depends. Sometimes they just work. Almost just you know like a lot of artists will talk. It just it happens to you almost, mm -hmm. and um, and then other times like my I mean my my studio is full of like paintings it's like just the face and I didn't like it and it's at that point what are you gonna do so like, I just have like stacks of like stuff like right. gave up on I'll try again later um so yeah it just it really depends it's hard to know um, and so much of it is just like even if it's done technically well sometimes you just it misses the spirit of what you're going for mm -hmm. which is hard to explain um so yeah it's it's a mysterious thing painting yeah so I, you know, once I found out, you know, you were a featured artist for doing the podcast, I, I get on your website, look at your paintings, and I don't have the most refined artist's eye, but I could <laughs> tell, I think, that a lot of your paintings that you're doing now, and I, I think you mentioned this, are done more with the, more with the knife than, than with the paintbrushes. So now that your professor's restriction is off, <laughs> what have you found the special advantages of it are, and what, what do you think... Would you feel hindered if you went back to brushes? Yeah, so brushes, I'm actually sort of a couple years ago, I think two years ago or so, I decided I was gonna start playing around with brushes because I think, I don't know, it was a challenge. And I love, um, so if you get on my website, I have my paintings, but then I also have this whole other totally random section that's like, these like illustration-y stuff with this like pen and ink borders and I liked those by the way yeah no it's I, totally I actually different. I I, yeah. I I was like oh <laughs> and I did like a huge like Middle Earth map for one of my friends for a wedding present I mean I love like you know where I'm just like paint like you know pen and inking these like little tree dots for like 17 hours <laughs> so I love that like nitpicky detail stuff too so I was like you know maybe like maybe the brushes would be fun because I, I want to get a little more detail, I think. So it's been a newer thing for me to figure out, um, which is fun. It has its own frustrations for sure because it's a totally new skill. I've not had any formal training on it, so it's a lot of just sort of self-taught mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. Is it the um, same medium? Yes, okay. still oil paint, yeah. Okay. Um, but it's good. I, I think with what I'm learning and trying with the brushes, I. I understand what my professor was on to because it's so easy for me to get so focused on the details mm -hmm. that I like I've, I've noticed myself sort of missing the big picture sometimes and um, just fussing for too much and before you know it like everyone every painter knows you can overwork something and you can't get it back you can't get the freshness back mm -hmm. um, so the same with a lot of writing here's oh, like, well yeah. that whole thing's gone just yeah. delete it all yeah right yeah <laughs> Right. Restart completely. Go back in your history, find the first draft. <laughs> like, <laughs> Not even that. Just completely clean slate. Yeah. You're like, well, that was like, what, 48 hours of work gone? Yeah. But soon as it has to happen. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, but it's all learning. Like, I think that's the thing is even though, even if you don't end up with something worth you, I was listening to one of the old Anselm podcasts the other day mm -hmm. and that idea of like putting the reps in, right? Mm -hmm. mm. Like, you're still putting the reps in, yeah. even if it ends up on a shelf, like right. you're doing the work. Yes. And not being so focused on like having something to show, which I think can be a little bit paralyzing yeah. mm -hmm. for people, mm -hmm. especially as like I'm very much like a perfectionist artist, which is just a recipe for imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and all those other things, <laughs> the the paralyzing art complex. <laughs> so so to that, 
again, your, your whole method with the, the big bold lines that you can't take back terrifies me <laughs> to my core. So if we were to like watch you in the, like in your studio painting, what will we see most of the time? Would you be like constantly like doing little movements with your knife or would you be like staring for a long time and then you do like one thing? That's a yeah, question. a little more of the second to be honest. Okay. Um, Probably like what you'd be doing is watching me mix paint for 60% of my time <laughs> to get the right color and you know, mixing and then holding it up and mixing and holding it up and then I get the right color. And then you have to think and you have to plan like not only what direction does this paint need to go around the form to make sense because mm -hmm. you know, you're not just paint by numbering, you're not mm -hmm. just filling in. You want movement in a specific direction. But then there's other things <laughs> which is a little bit of like the unknown of, of painting world no one knows is even if a painting stroke should go a direction around a form, oil paint's pretty reflective. And so mm -hmm. you can put a stroke in the wrong direction where it doesn't matter how you display it, it'll be a glare. You'll have a glare mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And so you have to also sort of have that in mind um, of like how the light plays. Because even if you know you have a part that's black paint, if there's a glare on it, it's gonna read white and it's gonna yeah. Makes sense. Mess up, oh, mess up your tone. So, yeah. um, you, you plan and you think, and then you go for it. Execute. <laughs> yeah, and you figure out, you know, the direction to do the knife, whether it's a, a hard edge or you want a soft edge. Depends how you move the knife and how to carve things in. And, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I feel like it could be like Christina. If we're like, okay, we have a poem. We can only write it one word at a time, and if we write a word, we cannot erase it. <laughs> oh, God. that would so be like, a fun So you're just like staring that at the be, screen oh for like 20 minutes. Oh man. The. <laughs> <laughs> then you stare for another 20 minutes. <laughs> and, and then you feel so locked in, you're like, yep. that is. Oh, like, man. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah, that would be... Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's go to the the paintings that you're using for, for the Anselm Gallery itself. Yeah. So again, I think you mentioned this. All or most of the paintings you, you did before you even knew about the conference. So yeah. obviously you did not do the paintings with our theme in mind. But was there anything about your paintings that led you to think, oh, you know, that this would fit with this with this prompt that Anselm's giving? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that stood out to me about this theme of time is this idea of like past, present, future, like eternal, sort of that idea of like things that we can see now or like way we can live our lives now or the way we do our art now and how that has ties to eternity. Um, and I think with portraiture and so there for my art in general, just because it is portraiture, um, there's um, that idea of the people that we know and the people that we see out in the world as being immortal. Sort of that C.S. Lewis quotes of "We don't know any mere mortals." You know, mm -hmm. you know, we see things like the Grand Canyon, and we're so in awe and we're bowled over by that, and yet the people that we live our lives with are going to last far longer into eternity than that. And I think it's easy to forget that. And mm -hmm. so sort of viewing the people around us as normal as they may seem to us, as sort of with the gravity that they actually have. Mm -hmm. I think that it, it almost goes back to what you were talking about earlier, where it's like the all these moments, you know, like the, the sun going through a leaf for this moment, then it's gone, trying yeah. to like capture that. It's like one, one tiny slice of like, an eternal narrative, maybe? Yeah. yeah. And just as sort of, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Lewis, I'm not sure, who talks about like signposts to eternity, things mm. that point us elsewhere. Um, and I think whether it's in, you know, writing or storytelling, we, we understand these kind of like typologies of things that mean other things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think portraiture as a way to, I don't know, remind us of other things. Um, it's not just about like, oh, well, I think noses are fun to paint. Like I think, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't, no one likes noses. <laughs> I, like, I definitely okay. do. It's you, the hardest part for sure. Did, but. <laughs> so, yeah. For me too, what I, what I love and I'm so intrigued about more like you diving into sort of that, that eternity in faces, right? Is, is like God created all of creation, right? And he saw that all of it was good and he created all of it, um, with this like goodness and truth and beauty, but like it was mankind that was made in his image. Mm -hmm. So what I find really fascinating is, is that kind of point where, for me anyway, me looking at myself, 
and my children and sometimes my parents or grandparents and you see this sort of like cyclical and yet not cyclical understanding of of time like you see almost yourself sort of woven through mm -hmm. the lives of your past and your future or your future in, in the sense of like your kids carrying mm -hmm. on some of that legacy and you see the fluidity you see how it changes over time but you also like can just tell it that eternity is is kind of this like band right yeah. almost like if you were to picture like a like, I don't know, a belt or something on a car. I don't know. I, I don't know my car parts. Don't, don't, don't mess with me. <laughs> that, like, I, what do you call it like Thank that? you so much for looking at me as if you find that I know about car parts. I don't, but I, I'm really flattered that you, that you did that. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You seem like the type. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. But yeah, I just, like, it's, it's, I mean, you can get that, you know, in, in, you know, you can look at, like you said, the Grand Canyon, and you see that beautiful sliver of mm -hmm. beauty and eternity and see God in it. But there is something about, like, for me, like, anyway, seeing people live their lives over and over again mm -hmm. and, and history replay itself and yet not. And you sort of see and get kind of like the cyclical nature of yeah, it. Yeah, and even just how our relationships are so interwoven, but, but almost outside of time. Like, I remember right. a yeah. few years ago I was talking to somebody because, you know, growing up... Um, my grandparents and then some great aunts of mine were pretty vocal about like specifically feeling called to pray for me and my sister. Mm. And when they passed away, I almost had this fear of like, well, like, what am I gonna, like, am I, have I lost, like, if I don't have their <laughs> prayers, like, is my life all of a sudden just, like, they were, like, holding things mm -hmm. together and realizing, like, no, that's so outside of time. Like, their prayers for me in the past are as effective today mm -hmm. as mm. when they're alive. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. like, this kind of, like, the roles that we have in each other's lives aren't really bound by time the way right. that we, at least in, in every way, some of them they are, but, um, and like those relationships are so, I don't know, integral. Yeah, it's true. Well, because like, you know, God is not bound by time, right? Mm -hmm. But we are. So if we think if we're addressing a God who's not bound by time, then obviously he can act outside yeah. of time. Anyway, it's, it's, it's yeah. a little, like, it's a little trippy. like, yeah, <laughs> trippy, <but. laughs> I remember this, um, <clears throat> this past, this past, um, so in our anniversary this past year yeah so our anniversary our wedding anniversary is in um, February and you know everyone was just so sick this year just constantly we were too like our whole family just sick and sick and sick um and February we had this like plan what we're gonna do for our anniversary it was our 12th anniversary um we had had an anniversary trip that had failed because of COVID anyway that's a whole different adventure that's a long and very <laughs> that's sad a lot. story yeah, yeah. Like, yes. so we don't go there <laughs> But, um, but anyway, we were so sick during our anniversary and we'd been sick for just weeks before and then, anyway. So we're like, okay, well, what can we do? Like, we, we want to just do something to celebrate. It's like, well, we still have that old wedding video. Like, yeah. you know, the kids are old enough. They're, they're six and um, six and four and a half, almost five. And, um, and I'm like, what if we just like watched our wedding video and showed the kids? Like, yeah. it might be weird, but like, Pretty we fun. might not get it. But anyway, so... What we ended up doing was having mimosas because we, we told ourselves that it involved orange juice, so it was healthy, you know, vitamin oh, yeah. C. Oh, yep. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. That's science. Yeah, it's science, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and just like sitting, like we had fevers, we were sitting on the couch, oh. we were watching our wedding video. But there was this like, like I remember looking over at Brian and the kids were in our laps and just kind of like clambering or just kind of asking kind of funny questions. And I just had this moment, like looking over at Brian and smiling at him. And just this this weird sense of watching myself say my vows, right? Yeah. Like 12 years ago. And looking across the couch at my husband and having two little kids. And there was just something I felt like while I was saying those vows and promising my life to my husband, like he had this moment, right? Mm -hmm. Where we were sitting on the couch together, like wrapped up in his time for me and his plan for me. And he was, I almost felt like he was holding it close to reveal it to me later when I was ready. And... I don't know, for some reason it was just this really cool moment of, of having it all yeah. like, congeal is not quite the right word, but come together, right? Yeah. In this like eternal way. It's just like glimpse through the veil. Yeah. Like for just a second, you almost can get what it means for to not be bound by time. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. in this almost like sixth sense that you just right. feel it, but then it's gone. Yeah. So, it, it was yeah. wild. It was wild. So that was kind of my my takeaway. I was like, okay, Lord, yeah, if, if, I, if we weren't super sick, I wouldn't have had this moment, right? Like, okay, like, I, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> yeah, and uh, to, to that point about, like, the glimpses, the signposts, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, 
how you go about selecting the, the subjects for your portraiture. Like, do you find someone at a cop shop like, excuse me, ma'am, uh, <laughs> may I paint you? Or do you like just find photos? What, what's your how, what's your method and what's your thing to be like, yep, that one can be like one of those signposts that we've been talking about. Yeah, so um, I've done it a little bit differently in at different times, but there tends to be a, a little bit of similarity. So. I take all my own reference photos just because I'm looking for a pretty specific um, contrast lighting that is a little bit hard to get just from like a random photo or, or and you know, you don't want to get into finding stuff online because you're never quite sure who owns what and it's mm -hmm. just better just mm -hmm. to get your own stuff. And so um, it's been a mixture. So for a little while I did a lot of self portraits cause Hey, like it's real convenient. You're got your own faces right there. Mm -hmm. And so and just ask Rembrandt, right? It's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's right. It's easy. Um, so I have a few of those. And then after that, it's been, it's been people in my life, people that I care about, that I love friends who are a little more acquaintances, but I've, find have interesting faces, um, which is, you know, you have to be careful how you tell people. <laughs> interesting face. Um, but it's a, com it's a compliment. It's a character it's a face. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah, they've got like main character vibes, right? Just, you can just tell. Um, and so then at that point I set up little, little, they're probably more elaborate than, you know, photo shoots where I have lighting and I decide what I want them to wear. Um, for some of them, I've like used like sheets and done some draping and some interesting stuff like that. And then at that point, it's sort of just interacting with them, having them move mm -hmm. around, which takes a while for people to get comfortable, um, mm -hmm. taking hundreds of photos and then looking through them and trying to find ones that capture those unique moments mm -hmm. that they didn't know they were doing. <laughs> just that, that look or that feeling or, or, you know, it's just a photo that I like. Um, I, I like, with my palette knife especially, really high contrast, so very strong lights and darks. Um, tends to work really well for that medium, which you'll notice in my paintings. Um, and so, and you, you, know, you can get really good light in the eyes. It's just, you can get really beautiful, beautiful things happening. Um, and yeah, and then I plan out how big, what canvases, composition, things like that, whether I want to do just one model in the picture, I want to combine photos or do more models, more than one model in a, in a picture. Um, a lot of it depends like if I'm trying to tell a specific story, which might maybe more models would be helpful with, or if I'm just trying to like encapsulate one specific person or this like this certain note, I guess. All right, well, we are running low on time now, so final <laughs> question. Uh, so let's say listeners here, they, they listen to me and Christina's advice and they buy their tickets to the Imagination Museum <laughs> Conference, or they, they come visit uh, the, your gallery or one of your exhibitions, looking at your paintings. How, what advice would you give them to like, what, what should they be looking for when they're viewing your art? What should they be interacting with? Mm. Yeah, so, um, you know, not everybody necessarily is drawn or thinks they're drawn to portraiture and that's okay you know it's not everyone's favorite subject matter and that's all right um, but I would just encourage people to just look at it and think you know how you feel what what do you feel the model is saying maybe what was that emotion that I was trying to pick out um, look at it from really far away look at it really close up um, with you or if you have kids, if, is there a specific color in it that you really like or a specific area? I have a lot of texture, so a lot of like small areas of the paintings are just really interesting. So mm -hmm. see if there's like a specific area that you really like um, and or your least favorite, like find, you know, maybe don't tell me, but um, <laughs> I, yeah, I had a, in my studio a couple weeks ago, I was having like an open studio and this guy came in and he was like, oh yeah, look at this. And he showed it to his wife and he's like, what do you think? And she was like, I don't like portraits. And I was like, I'm right here. <laughs> so, you know, maybe, which, you know, it's fine to feel that way, but you know, maybe not like right in front Next of the artist. Next to the artist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, all right, well, thanks for being honest. Um, so yeah, look from far away, look close up. Um, one of the interesting things is like, see, you know, when you stand far away, um, the information, the, the form that's shown, and then get close up and see how few strokes it takes to convey something. Mm -hmm. Like, sort of the minimalism, especially with my palette knife stuff, that's something I've played with, is like, how do I only use the paint strokes that are needed and not mm -hmm. 
just add more, you know, what's the least amount of information mm. to show the story. Um, and then, yeah. And then there's one quote that I wanted to read from this Robert Henry book that talks about sort of this, I, how to like look at art. And he, so he says, the man who has honesty, integrity, the love of inquiry, the desire to see beyond is ready to appreciate good art. He needs no one to give him an art education. He's already qualified. He needs but to see pictures with his active mind, look into them for the things that belong to him, and he will find soon enough in himself an art connoisseur and an art lover of the first order. Awesome. I love so that. Cool. All right, well, like, like we mentioned, uh, it's Nicole Beck Conklin, the featured artist at this year's Imagination Redeemed conference. Uh, for listeners who might want to look at your art, learn more about you, where, where can they find you? So my website is where most of my, all my completed stuff is, other than like more recent stuff. Um, so it's NicoleBeckStudio.com. Um, I have an Instagram under the same name as well, which is not always updated as much as I should, but um, there's a little bit more behind the scenes stuff there. You can see a little more process of how I start with an underpainting and then palette on top of it. Um, but yeah, my website is probably the best way to see completed work. All right, awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. This is super interesting. Christina, I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to the Imagination Redeem Conference. Oh, just a wee bit, you know, <laughs> you know. tiny, tiny, you know. <laughs> Not like it's one of Not the best all. things ever. <laughs> Nothing like that. Well, listeners, as y'all can probably tell, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. The fire is down to embers. The customers are trundling home. You've polished off your final glass. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Uh, please rate and review the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitch, wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps us and we really appreciate it. Thank you again for listening, and we'll catch you next time.